Good stuff. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'll try and keep this pretty punchy. I know you've sat through a lot of presentations. I've spent most of my uh, career in capital markets uh, sitting in those chairs next to you, and I know how long these days get, so I'll, I'll get right into it. And I'd like to do uh, some Q&A as well. Uh, my name's Neil Morata. I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders, president and CEO of Indiva. We're a licensed producer in Canada. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about our business today, why we think our, our stocks are screaming by here, uh, which I'm sure we all do. Uh, everyone presenting up here probably feels the same way. Um, I did spend uh, about six years living in Boston uh, many years ago working at Fidelity Investments. I was a portfolio manager there uh, and an analyst. Certainly didn't think I'd be a CEO of a cannabis company. I didn't ever think there'd even be cannabis companies that were legal. Uh, so this has been an exciting journey over the last six years. And uh, we're a little bit different than uh, I would say the typical cannabis story in the sense that we didn't set out to be a big global vertically integrated dominant anything. Uh, we set out to uh, earn a terrific return on capital, which to me is the most important metric. Um, we, can, we can debate that, but uh, you know, it seems like only in the last 10 or 15, maybe 20 years with the tech bubble, we got into this price to click and price to hope. Uh, I don't know what these stocks are trading at, price per square foot at some point. That is not how we look at this business. We look at how much revenue and cash flow can we produce from our facility, and then we'll think about building a second facility. We did not take the tact of building six factories in four countries uh, and telling everybody how much we were gonna grow and sell. Um, let me get right into it here. Um, so we're, we're, our market cap now is only about uh, 25 million. Um, we just completed an $11 million debt financing we announced last week. Uh, our facility is 100% built, 75% uh, licensed. Um, we have one remaining license to get, which is our oil sales license that will allow us to sell the uh, oils and edibles that we have building up uh, in our vault and our inventory. We expect that before the end of the year. And we think once we get that uh, in place, uh, we're on track to you know, be a 100 million plus revenue company or at least hit that run rate, we hope, next year. Uh, we'll do that through focus on very specific products. Uh, right now we sell pre-rolls in Ontario. We're rolling those out to other provinces. We'll have products in Quebec uh, later this year. Uh, and then the big bet that we've made is on some of these edible products. Uh, and what we've done intentionally, and, and we did these deals a couple of years ago, uh, was to license award-winning cannabis products out of the U.S. to bring to Canada. Our view is that brands go north, not south. And so we did a joint venture with a company called Bang. Uh, Jamie Pearson presented uh, about an hour ago um, at this conference. Uh, we did another deal with a company in Seattle called Deep Sail uh, that makes ruby cannabis sugar and sapphire salt. So we're, we're not growers. We don't have a far, uh, farm. We have a factory. Uh, the people that run our business are CPG executives that have spent decades in companies like Nestle, General Mills, uh, Clorox, Maple Leaf Foods, Pepsi, et cetera. Uh, and that's, that's really how we uh, intend to manage this going forward. I'll skip through some of these text-dense uh, slides. Uh, we were, are really bullish on edibles, uh, particularly in Canada. Uh, the illicit market in Canada grows pretty good flour. Uh, we grow pretty good flour too, but it's the least differentiated product. When you go on the OCS website, there's over 100 SKUs of what I affectionately call who cares weed in a bag. That is not where we want to play. The only province we'll even sell cannabis in a jar uh, is Quebec because they uh, demanded it from us. We went right to pre-rolls with Ontario. It's a better margin and it's a product. And that's what we are. We make excellent cannabis products. So our pre-rolls are well-liked, our market share uh, is still uh, mid single digits, uh, uh, close to high single digits in Ontario, I think as a result of the quality of the product. And that doesn't uh, necessarily just mean the flower itself, it's how we put it together. I joke all the time, maybe too often now, that our, our director of ops spent 12 years making drumsticks at Nestle, not drumsticks that you play with, but that with drumsticks that you eat. Uh, and now she makes the pre-rolls, runs the teams that make the pre-rolls. So this is why we have what we consider to be a high quality product, very consistent. We even go to a step of lining up relatively symmetrical uh, half-gram pre-rolls in, in a two-pack so that nobody feels like they're getting ripped off. You'd be surprised how different two half-gram pre-rolls can look. So we're a product company. We think that's an inclusive product. But edibles, um, we saw this coming down the pipe where we thought, look, once the bloom comes off the rose on how big is your greenhouse, how much do you grow, uh, and what's your capacity, people will start focusing on what really matters, which is revenue, market share, margins, and profitability. And so we're lucky enough and, and thankful that we signed a joint venture with Bang. 
Um, we have the chocolate in-house, we have the equipment in-house, we have the molds. We'll be pouring chocolate by the end of the week. Uh, and so we're just waiting anxiously, just like the rest of uh, Canada, to be able to sell these products. Again, we have it negotiated, priced, and agreed upon with the OCS, so as soon as we're licensed uh, to sell these products, we will. And in the meantime, we'll keep building inventory. Edibles is a big chunk of the market. I mean, when you look at mature markets, it's upwards of 20% of the total. So it's not a small little niche. And yes, there's a lot of products in there. Uh, we'll look to add more products going forward, but um, there's not a lot of companies in Canada actually ready to make cannabis chocolate. And uh, had the opportunity to try many of the chocolate products. I feel very comfortable that the quality of the chocolate that we're using, which by the way is the exact same chocolate that you would get if you bought that product here in, in uh, Chicago once it becomes legal, uh, or in California if we were to go there and buy it now. And we think that's the essence of global branding. So that when you try a bang chocolate in Toronto, it's going to taste the same as the one that you bought in San Diego, for instance. Uh, and so we think this is a product with a lot of potential. Um, we think we'll have terrific margins on this. And uh, pun fully intended, we think Canadians will eat it up. We uh, make great products, so we're focused on pre-rolls, we're making gel capsules, we will make chocolate, the sugars, the salts. Uh, we're building a very large extractor at our facility, not necessarily because we want to compete with the Valens and Meta Farms of the world. Uh, we're clients of them, so uh, similar to what Everett said in his presentation today, it's sort of complimentary. Uh, but it's a big extraction system. We do have a deal with TerraSend uh, to do some extraction for them. We have a lot of people knocking on our door, particularly with hemp right now. Uh, looking for a place to, to uh, extract the CBD. So we're, we're uh, not sort of following this dogma that either you're a brand or you're a co-pack. We think you can do both. Uh, so we announced a deal earlier this week with uh, the Supreme Canvas Company. Uh, many of you may have tried their products or know the company uh, to make pre-rolls for them. That's a very profitable business for us. Uh, so we're very excited to get that going. We have capacity to make uh, you know 10 to 20 million pre-rolls a year in our facility. Uh, out of one or two small rooms, that massively out earns a grow. So growing plants inside, you can grow great quality, and we do, uh, but in time, I think you'll see that be a much smaller focus for the company. It's not vertical integration for the sake of it. Um, this is just where we started from a regulatory perspective four years ago. All we could do was grow. So we have this legacy grow. We think that'll only be about 10 or 15% of our revenue going forward. Uh, most of it will go into pre-rolls. We're happy to make pre-rolls for others. We're happy to do extraction for others. But the real reason we're building this 70-ton ethanol system, actually, that's one shift. It could do a lot more than that, is to control our supply chain. And this is another part of, I think, the cannabis business that, yes, it's a CPG business, but it's quirky in the sense that it's a very immature supply chain. And for us, edibles are so important uh, in terms of generating revenue and growing the company. Um, we don't want to be at the back of the line uh, waiting for product. We don't want to run out of distillate. I think in maybe two to five years, I don't know what the time frame will be, you know, we'll probably be swimming in flour and swimming in distillate. We'll have a very mature supply chain. Uh, that's a different story. By then, we'll have massively out-earned the, the capital put into the extractor, but we won't be sitting around waiting to be able to participate in the market. This chart also shows something we don't talk about too often, but we think it's very interesting. There's a massive amount, if you look at the big orange dot here, we call this the, the dot of opportunity, but uh, there's millions of Canadians that used cannabis last year, admitted to doing it in very, very tiny amounts. And we think that's partly because people don't want to smoke. Obviously, legality and access is still a big problem. Uh, not the legality part, but the access. Uh, and we think there's millions of Canadians that want to try cannabis, don't want to smoke, and so we think edibles has an opportunity to actually outperform in terms of share of market in Canada versus the U.S. Uh, we currently have supply agreements with Ontario and Quebec. Uh, we will be adding further provinces. Most of you understand the, the distribution model in Canada. It's direct to patient uh, medically. Uh, we'll start selling gel caps once we're licensed or in the next couple of months uh, to medical patients. We don't sell flour to medical patients. That was intentional because um, the rec market and the medical market are quite different for flour. If you're a medical user, um, you are going to be quite loyal to a certain strain because of the help that it gives you. And what we never wanted to be was in a position to say, we don't have any of your medicine in stock. So we said, let's focus on oil. It's a much more ubiquitous product. We can produce a heck of a lot more of it, and we won't have to disappoint medical patients. But we all sell to the government, and so this is actually, in a way, very good. Uh, 
There's some rumors uh, about a change up in the Ontario market, but it doesn't look like they're going to consider a direct to store model like we have in Saskatchewan, really the only province of significance where uh, we don't go through a provincial wholesaler. We're happy to do that because with 10 relationships, we can cover the whole country. With half a dozen relationships, we can cover 90% of Canada. So I think it helps a smaller LP like Indiva that's, uh, let's say, a little more focused on the capital that, that, it, that it has and that it puts out uh, versus bigger players that can send marching armies around the country educating doctors or, or going to stores. So this is <laughs> hopefully next year at this conference if we're lucky enough to be invited back um, or if somebody doesn't acquire us between now and then, uh, we'll have a lot more check marks on this board. But this is sort of the matrix that describes how we grow revenue. So what you don't see is uh, 120 product launches. Uh, we're launching four chocolate SKUs uh, in December, and that's the only edible that we're launching right away. Uh, we do gel capsules right now. We have uh, some flour that we're sending to go back in pre-rolls. So that's a very tight list of products. That's intentional. So we'll roll out these products. We'll add more provinces, and, and then that's how we get this exponential revenue growth into uh, 2020. This is just a, again, just to keep focused on what we do. Uh, so this is a limit. These are the only products we're allowed to sell in Canada right now, for those of you that don't know specifically. It's flour, and it's maximum 3% THC oil or CBD oil, but it's, this is, these are very basic products. This is nothing like what you would see in a dispensary in the United States. That's going to change dramatically in January, uh, and then I would say that in one or two years' time, I think you'll see hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of products on the shelves. These are the products, uh, some examples of what we licensed. This is absolutely the most boring uh, <laughs> packaging you'll ever see in your life, but it is compliant. Uh, and the good news is that we all play by the same rules. So, you know, 90% of the real estate and all of the primary colors generally uh, belong to the government, not to us. Um, but we're really happy to be partnered with a company like Bang. You know, as, as a finance guy, uh, using the term loosely, I don't like science experiments. So, you know, when I hear about other bigger companies saying, yeah, we're making chocolate, but, you know, we're sort of fiddling with the formulations. We don't think we have it right yet. I'm, I'm absolutely... Uh, sleeping terrifically at night knowing I don't have to figure out formulations. You know, Scott Van Rixel from Bang is uh, a real pioneer and, and visionary in this industry, uh, and so we're more than happy to launch uh, two of their 14 flavors right off the bat. Not 14, I think that's nuts. Uh, when I hear other companies talking about launching 100 products in January, I mean, Johnson & Johnson wouldn't launch 100 products in January. Procter & Gamble would never do that. It's just a, it sounds like a, a crazy endeavor to me. So we'll start with these two uh, flavors, and we'll do a THC and a CBD. Each one will be 10 milligrams. Uh, we think the retail price point will be about $5. Um, that's still the cheapest date in town, as far as I can tell. If you really need a stronger dose, you can eat two of them. Uh, that's $10. You can't buy a glass of wine in Toronto for $10 at, at, at a hotel or a bar. So we think this is a great value proposition. And let's say a way for people to be part of the cannabis industry, put their toe in, try a product. Uh, we'll make these in CBD as well. So. If you're not looking for that psychoactive effect or that high, uh, you can try this delicious chocolate and it will taste like chocolate, not weed chocolate. And this is really the benefit of, uh, you know, we think A, working with Bang, but this is where I think we can be much better than the illicit market. I've tried personally a lot of edibles in Canada to make sure that we have the, uh, the right products and most of the chocolate I've tried tastes like weed chocolate. I, there might be a small fraction of the population that wants chocolate that tastes like that, but. I think the vast majority of people are going to choose an edible because they actually want to taste it when they eat it. If you just want the cannabinoids, you could just pop a gel cap, and we, we make those too. The bottom products, I think, are kind of our sleeper products um, that we license from Deep Cell, so the sugar and the salt. Um, you know, asking grandma to pack the pipe is a really big ask, but CBD, sugar, and her tea is a small ask. So it's another way to target those millions of Canadians that use cannabis in really tiny amounts. Uh, and you know, the goal is not to maximize how much each Canadian consumes on an annual basis, but if we can uh, provide a way for people to come into the cannabis market without having to roll a joint or smoke a pipe or smoke anything or worry about, is this vaporizer going to hurt me? Am I going to get a lung problem? Uh, I think this is a, this is a much more, uh, let's say, gentle way for people to get introduced to cannabis. And we think that the sugar and salts also have terrific B2B potential. So, you know, you can imagine in the future maybe there will be sites, cafes or... Um, restaurants where you have infused meals. Uh, Quebec's a good example too, where Quebec is not going to allow chocolates or cookies or anything that's appealing to kids. So we think that this sugar uh, product 
is not appealing to kids. I think you'd have a, a it's a real stretch saying a kid's gonna eat a pack of sugar. Definitely a kid is not gonna eat a pack of salt. That is not a product that's appealing to kids. So we think in that province, you know, and there's upwards of six million people in Quebec, uh, we think a lot of people are gonna make their own. Uh, and so if, if you don't have to decarboxylate your cannabis in the oven and stink up your house, if you can just put sugar into your recipe, we think that's a real easy way for, for people to use the product. Um, not gonna spend too much time in this slide. I talked a little bit about it, but um, you know, most of these folks um, have uh, enough gray hair <laughs> that we're in good hands uh, and have had spent a lot of time in CPG industries. Um, so we're in good shape. This is a, a rendering of what uh, we hope our farm gate store will look like at the front of our facility. And, uh, and this is sort of a layout of, of our facility. And how we look at this 40,000 square feet is how do we maximize revenue and cash flow from this building? In Canada, the license is very much tied to the address. Uh, we do own the land and building. Uh, if there came a time where um, we needed and wanted to expand, we could buy neighboring property and, and expand the site. So we're not, we're not landlocked or anything of this nature. But we think we can do over 100 million of revenue just out of this building. And what I'd point out is that when you see all these flower rooms, you know, taking 10 to 15,000 square feet, uh, I can generate more revenue out of one of these smaller processing rooms on the left than I can from all of those flower rooms. That's not to say that, you know, we don't respect the plant or love the plant. Uh, I think it's just we're interested in providing a return on capital to shareholders. Insiders own about 20% of the company. Uh, my family and I have invested, you know, a couple million of our own money into this. So this is really our focus, not about, you know, of course we're building a brand just like everybody else, but it's not for the sake of building a brand, it's to generate that return. So that's it, I'm happy to take some questions. So you have two provinces that have already made agreements with you. How many outlets will that give you, and how soon do you think you'll have agreements with the rest of the provinces? I'm sure, I'm sure everyone heard that with the mic. So the question was how many? All right. Yeah, so sorry. two provinces yeah. have made agreements with you. Mm -hmm. How many outlets does that give you to actually sell you, your products, and when will how you have outlets? agreements with the rest of the products? Did uh, you say, so you say outlets? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, in terms of stores, Quebec and Ontario only have about 25 stores each right now, which is a pathetic number. That will change. Uh, the LCBO is our, our uh, provincial liquor control board. There are 800 liquor stores in Ontario and only 25 cannabis stores. So if you want an idea where that's going to go, I, I would say, you know, you'll see there's another 50 stores that got licensed that should open soon in Ontario. Uh, Ontario is, uh, has the most revenue of all the provinces, even with just those 25 stores. So, um, I mean, it is what it is, but I would expect those store counts. That Alberta has 300 stores, uh, by example. So, uh, look, I mean, I think it's, kind of, it's the only game in town. Uh, a lot of people still buy online, roughly 20% of the revenue, but we would expect those store counts to go up a lot. Okay, thanks. Thanks for Okay, sure, yeah, happy to. That packaging is hideous. I know you can't do anything about it now, but is the industry working to change that to maybe have more improved packaging and stuff? Um, I think the short answer is yes, but there's a much longer answer to it, which is, you know, I, I, look, I don't think branding is about pretty boxes. Um, what I would say, though, is if you look at our pre-roll packaging on the left, it's all cardboard. So the feedback that we've gotten from consumers uh, maybe less so from marketing folks, but from consumers is there's just way too much packaging for one or two grams of cannabis and there's too much plastic. So what we've done is gone with an all basically paper uh, box so at least you can recycle it. Yes, it's wrapped in a little bit of cellophane, but you know, I've seen packaging that have these big huge plastic boxes and there's you know, a couple of popcorn buds bouncing around in there. It's not, it's not attractive at all. We, we're constantly trying to improve what we do. Um, the other side of the coin though, just pragmatically, again, as a finance guy, everyone has been used to buying cannabis in you know, a Ziploc bag. And so this is maybe just a glorified child resistant Ziploc bag. Um, and I, I, what I don't see though are a lot of people saying, I'd buy your cannabis if your packaging was nicer. At, at the end of the day, what matters is what happens when they take the product out of that, out of that package. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I would argue that it's, it's the same rules for everybody. So it's another example of, you know, we've, we've only invested about 55 million of total capital into this. 
not 550. If I had raised $5 billion, I'd probably sleep a little better at night, but I would then have the pressure of trying to earn a return on $5 billion. I mean, if the Canadian market is 10 billion of total retail top line revenue and half of that is wholesale, I'm not sure you can earn any kind of return on 5 billion of capital just in Canada. It can't be done. It's just not big enough. Uh, so you're forced to go internationally and I think a lot of these stocks, there was a point when the biggest cannabis stock was valued at the same price as Loblaws and for Canadians in the room, I mean, that's a hundred year old grocery company uh, that does 10 billion a quarter of top line revenue, a billion a quarter of EBITDA. So, um, you know, we're quite happy with, with how we positioned ourselves and, and, and the rules are the same for everybody. So if you had all this extra capital lying around, you could invest in all kinds of fancy whiz bang packaging and maybe that would help improve your, let's say your sales at the, on the margin. Um, but we're in the same boat as everybody else. Yeah, we just closed an $11 million debt financing, so we're, we feel like we're good. Okay. The most important thing? Uh, honestly, it's, it's people, uh, you know, as we're scaling up here. So we're, we're north of 80 employees now. Uh, a year ago, we were under 40 employees. Actually, in the summer, we were under 40 employees. So we're scaling up to manage the pre-roll businesses, and then the rest is equipment. So we're doing about 40,000 gel caps a day. Uh, we have a couple of pieces of equipment uh, just to speed up the automation. Uh, that'll take us to north of 100,000 a day. Uh, and then once that's done, I mean, our goal is to generate as much free cash flow as we can. Uh, we're not in a rush to pay a dividend, but I would love to be able to pay a dividend. I think one day these will be treated like typical CPG stocks, and that's what people are going to expect. In the, in the stock, you mean? Yeah, so this is interesting. When I worked at Fidelity, we used to monitor something called days to trade 1%. And so in our case, between our TSX Venture listing and our OTC QX listing, on a decent day, we might trade half a million shares. Um, we have 84 million shares out. Our float's about, I don't know, 60 million shares. So we're, we're trading almost 1% of that float on a daily basis. The issue is that we're micro cap with a 25 million market cap, so there's only so much dollar liquidity you're gonna get. Uh, but in terms of most of the, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not bad. It trades pretty well on, on the OTCQX as well. Yeah, most of it is in Canada, you're right, but uh, there's, there, I would say relative to the size of the company, like liquidity could be worse. There's a lot of micro caps that I've seen, owned and traded in the past in, in, in my career where they trade by appointment. Some of them don't even trade every day. Uh, so, I mean, on a good day, we might trade upwards of a million shares in, in Toronto and in the U.S. combined. That's a lot of stock on, on a small company. Yeah. Okay. I think I've gone over. Thanks, everybody.